following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. We're going to continue talking about the scripture by Shankaracharya called Atma Bodha. In the previous two lectures, we were explaining how this scripture from Hinduism presents the philosophy of Vedanta, which is a, one of the most important philosophies of Hinduism. The important thing to remember about Vedanta is that it is not a philosophy like a Western philosophy something designed to be played with in the intellect. Real Vedanta, or any philosophy from the genuine uh, Asian traditions, is the root knowledge or theory that should accompany practice. It's not just something to sit and think about or debate. So when we study the scripture Atma Bodha, it is written for those who are putting into practice the principles that it describes. In order to understand Atma Bodha, we need to understand that there are two truths in life. And this is the core foundation for really all Asian philosophy is to understand that there are two truths, not one. Some philosophies tend to approach their exposition seeking a single truth. And even in the Gnostic tradition, we say there is one truth and one reality. But in its practical manifestation, it reveals itself as being dual having two fundamental truths. And this seems to contradict the message of Vedanta, which says that there is no duality, there is only unity. And this apparent contradiction is not a contradiction at all. It is an appearance. An appearance that clouds our perspective. It's an appearance that happens because of our mind. The reality is that these two truths are one. The two truths are simple. The first truth is the ultimate reality. The ultimate nature of all things it is what we call the absolute. It is the ultimate truth. It is reality in its complete visible aspect. It's absolute reality. It is the ultimate nature of all things. Visible to the consciousness. Visible to someone who's awake. That's the first truth. The absolute. The ultimate nature of all things. In Hinduism, in Vedanta, this is called Brahma. Or Sat-Chit. Absolute existence. The second truth 
which appears to contradict the first, is what we know as reality, what we call reality. We can call it conventional truth or what we seem to perceive as true. These two truths appear to contradict. The absolute reality and conventional reality. They appear to conflict with each other. Through our vision, through our hearing, through our sense of taste and touch and smell, we can perceive only a limited range of what is perceivable. And yet we call that perception truth. Not understanding that we're not perceiving everything that exists. We're only seeing a small fraction. Even in visible light, visible light is only a fraction of the energy that is perceivable. And even using all of our most advanced tools, we still only perceive a fraction of what is there. Someone with an awakened consciousness of sufficient degree of awakening can perceive both truths at the same time. The absolute nature of a thing and the conventional nature of a thing. And there's no contradiction. They see both sides. They see all of it. The reason this is important is because when we study philosophy, especially Vedanta, or tantric philosophy, which is very similar to the Vedanta. The presentation of truth is given in a very specific way. And if we don't understand the two truths and the nature of our own perception, we won't understand the philosophy and we'll make mistakes. So understanding that, we look at the third or fourth line of Atma Bodha, which says, Atman appears to be finite because of ignorance. When ignorance is destroyed, Atman, which does not admit of any multiplicity, truly reveals itself by itself, like the sun when the clouds pass away. Atman, of course, is Sanskrit and means self. And when we study Hinduism, the bulk of Hinduism is about coming to know the true self, the real self. We don't see that self because our vision is clouded by our so-called perception of reality. And that perception is our assumption that conventional reality, what we perceive through the senses, is real. We don't understand that actually we are in a state of ignorance when it comes to per our perception. We don't see the truth. We don't see the actual reality. Perception of the absolute reality is only possible when our perception is clean, when there are no filters clouding our ability to see. And this perception is not just physical perception. It's perception beyond the five senses. So what Atma Bodha is saying here, as written by Shankaracharya, is that Atman appears to be finite because of ignorance. What this line says is that we think that God is according to our ideas. And everybody has their own ideas about self. The atheists think that the self is their way of thinking and their way of believing. The Christians think that the self or God is an old man up in the clouds and that we are a soul who is required to bow and sing praises to this old man up in the clouds. And the Buddhists think that there is no self. But there is a Buddha who is a god somewhere in the universe. 
and the Muslims think the way they think, and the Taoists think the way they think, and all of us are mistaken. Because Atman cannot be perceived through our clouded perception. Our mind creates that finite appearance. In other words, our state of ignorance. As we explained previously, ignorance is a lack of knowledge, a lack of knowing, a lack of seeing. And as we explained, the word knowledge comes from the root to perceive, to see for oneself. Because we don't see our innermost for what it is, we're in a state of ignorance. And we think the innermost exists according to our ideas. Many spiritual people these days think that the innermost is themselves. We think that the innermost is a superior I, that it's master so-and-so, or that it is Gaia, or that it is a goddess, or that it is an angel clothed in a white robe. Whatever our particular religious fancy happens to be, we project that and put God in that box and think that our true self is in that box and we're wrong. The fact is, we have not perceived Atman and thus we don't know what Atman is. Knowledge of Atman comes through perception. To perceive Atman, we have to remove the ignorance that impedes that perception. And that ignorance is in us. It's in our psyche. We have to change how we see in order to see the truth. The second part here says, when ignorance is destroyed, Atman, which does not admit of any multiplicity, truly reveals itself by itself. Atman is not multiple. We are a great multiplicity. As I've been recommending through these lectures, when we're sincere and watching our own mind, watching what we can perceive constantly, it is inevitable that we will arrive at the conclusion that we are filled with contradictions. We are a complete multiplicity. From one moment to the next, we contradict ourselves. We are filled with competing desires. Atman does not have that. Atman does not contradict itself. Atman is pure. Eternity, bliss, consciousness, wisdom, knowledge, serenity, love. In Hebrew, the names that we use to describe Atman are Chesed and Gajula. And these mean love and mercy. Atman is one. Atman is a light that comes out of the Trinity. Atman is an expression of God, of the divine. So when certain philosophers study Vedanta, they study Buddhism or Hinduism or these different traditions, and they say, I am, because this is what Vedanta states, that we are Atman. These people are mistaken. Because we are not that, so long as we are trapped in multiplicity. Atman does not have multiplicity. If we find multiplicity in ourselves, we are not that. When the ignorance is destroyed, Atman is revealed. This is a very critical phrase in this scripture. This phrase explains the basis of liberation. And it explains why the followers of Shankaracharya have been mistaken for so long. Many of the followers of Shankaracharya, of Vedanta, and other philosophies that are similar, mistakenly believe that by having the concept of philosophy, of Vedanta, that they can be liberated. They mistakenly believe that because they've studied the scripture and they know the concepts of it, and they can debate it, that that's leading them to liberation. 
and they're wrong. Only one thing leads to liberation, the destruction of ignorance. And how is ignorance destroyed? Through perception of Atman. That is the only way. Knowledge of Atman destroys ignorance. Knowledge of reality. And that reality begins here and now in ourselves. Knowledge of the truth. Not what we want to be, not what we would like to be, not what we have been told will be, but what is. To see what is. And that begins here and now in ourselves. To look at ourselves and see ourselves as we are. Impure, suffering, and trapped in ignorance. Only by seeing that for what it is and our own role in perpetuating it can we eliminate ignorance. And in that process, Atman becomes revealed naturally in the same way the sun is exposed when the clouds move away. The clouds here are substances and constructions in our own psyche, inside of us. The only thing that perceives us from seeing the truth of the divine is our own mind. Nothing else. The only obstacle we have is our own mind. In the next passage, it's written, Cyclic existence, which is full of attachments, aversions, etc., is like a dream. It appears to be real as long as one is ignorant, but becomes unreal when one is awake. This phrase, cyclic existence, in Sanskrit, is samsara. Samsara is a state of suffering. It is the state of consciousness of any being that has ego. Even a small fraction of ego creates that percentage of samsara, cyclic existence. Thus, even the gods <coughs> suffer in samsara at their level. And this is why when we study the bhava chakra, or what's called the wheel of samsara, we see six realms. And even one of those six realms is the realms of the gods, the heavens, in which there are beings who are much purer than we are, but they still suffer because they still have ego. They have attachment. Cyclic existence, which is full of attachments and aversions, etc., is like a dream. Attachments and aversions. Attachments are those psychological phenomena that we chase, that we crave, that we want. Aversions are psychological phenomena that we want to avoid. And this dynamic between craving and aversion is what puts the wheel of samsara in motion. That wheel of samsara is our own psyche. It isn't outside of us. It's inside. It's psychological. That wheel is the repetition of psychological habits, chasing after our cravings and attachments and trying to avoid the things that we don't want. That's what creates suffering or samsara. That is a state of ignorance. And as it states here, it is like a dream. We think we're awake. We think that what we're experiencing is fundamentally real and true. And the scripture is telling us that it isn't. This is one level of our ignorance. We don't question what we perceive. We assume it's true and real. Because we are in a state of a lack of knowledge, a lack of perception of truth, we believe that what we see is true. We don't question it. We're not there at the gateway of our senses doubting what we see, analyzing what we perceive, questioning it, investigating it. We assume that what we perceive is real and true. 
In fact, this condition has become so pervasive and strong that now we can stare at a tiny little screen and believe that the images we see on that screen are real and true and become completely hypnotized by it. We can watch a movie or watch a video or a game and we believe so much in what we're seeing that our body is reacting. Chemicals are being produced in the body. If we're watching a violent movie, we react with fear. If we're watching something lustful, we react with lust or desire. If we're watching something that we want for ourselves, we react with envy. And the body produces chemicals and reactions. When someone's threatened in the movie, we get chills and scared. We jump. We cry out. When we see something sad, we shed tears. And all we're looking at are images. Images that are fake. Images made by actors who are lying to us. Who are saying something and acting like something that isn't true. But we believe it's true. Even if our mind says, well, I know they're actors and I know it's just a movie. I know it's not real. It's just a game. I'm only playing. Our consciousness does not think that. We become hypnotized. And the proof is in the reactions that we experience in our three brains. So if we can't even question our perception of what's on the computer screen or on the video monitor or on our cell phone or iPad or whatever device we use, then how are we questioning the reality around us that we perceive from moment to moment? We're not even questioning things that we tell ourselves we know are fake. And how are we even questioning the reality happening with our families and friends and our coworkers? We don't. This is our problem. This is why we're ignorant and this is why we suffer. Everything that we perceive truly is like a dream because we're asleep. And we have this dreaming state throughout our daily life. Thus, we have it when our physical body sleeps too. But when we awaken, here and now, we start to see the unreality of all of these things. And this is the training that we undergo. To begin to question what we perceive. To be awake. To see it for what it is. You can watch TV. But when you watch, look at how it is all fake. It's all lies. It's all designed to sell you something, an idea, a product, a belief. It isn't real. And the same goes in your daily life. What of what you see is actually real? We have to learn to question that and start to awaken. In studying that, we look at some terms and it's interesting to discover that these states of consciousness that we're describing are structured the same way in two of our most important traditions. In the Hindu tradition and in the Greek. Now naturally we know that the ancient Indians and the ancient Greeks had a lot of exchange of ideas and commerce. But this philosophy of consciousness is far older than both the Greeks and the Hindus. Nevertheless, the state of consciousness that we're describing here in Sanskrit is called susupti. It is a state of very deep hypnotism, a complete lack of self-awareness. It is the lowest possible state of consciousness. It is the state of consciousness that all of us are in most of the time. In Greek, its equivalent is akasya. Akasya is a state of consciousness defined by animal instinct. And honestly, sincerely, when we watch ourselves and we observe behavior of people, we see that most of our behaviors are guided purely by instinct and desire. 
impulse. Very little cognizance. It's a state in which there is absolutely no self-awareness and not even any interest in consciousness. A complete state of ignorance. Lacking all awareness of God, of the being, of the Buddha, whatever name you want to put to Atman. A little bit better than that is the second state of consciousness. This state in Hinduism or Sanskrit is called Svapna. And its equivalent in Greek is Pistis. Now this word Pistis has different functions and different uses. We're talking about it now in the context of states of consciousness. This degree of consciousness, or the second degree, is characterized by dreaming. In fact, svapna in Sanskrit means dream. And this is a state of consciousness in which it's not purely instinctive and animalistic. It's a little better. There could be little flashes of conscience. A little bit of awareness that, well, if I do this, somebody might not like it, or I might get in trouble, or it may not be good for me to do it, or maybe there's a cost to it. But still, this is a state of psychological sleep, a state of ignorance, only slightly better. This is a state in which you might remember what you did, maybe. In the first state, susupti, or akasya, we generally don't remember these times at all. We're completely asleep. If you think back over the last seven days, can you remember every moment of what you were doing from moment to moment for seven full days? And I don't just mean during the daylight. I mean when your body's asleep too. None of us can because we're asleep. Those periods of time where we have absolutely no memory correspond to susupti or akasya, a complete lack of consciousness, zero consciousness. We are completely mechanical. Doing whatever we do, whether it's good or bad or indifferent, In the second stage, svapna, we're dreaming. We're in a, a dream state. Our physical body can be active, doing whatever we do every day, but we are dreaming. We're not aware of ourselves. We're not aware of God. We're not aware of anything other than the projections of our mind. A dream state. And we keep this state during the night and during the day. This is the state in Greek is called pistis. Those who have received a little training learn about a third state. You cannot experience this state mechanically, accidentally. You can't experience this state by chance. Although everyone thinks that they have it all the time. The third state of consciousness in Sanskrit is called Jagrata. And in Greek, Dianoia. This is a state of awakened consciousness. Jagrata means awake. In this state of consciousness, one is aware of oneself. Conscious of one's actions. Thoughts, feelings, conscious of what one sees and does. It's possible that at stages of life, like when you're a child, you may have flashes of this time. When you're a baby, you exist in this state, Jagratha. Babies are awake. But as the ego incorporates into the personality, as we grow older and we develop a lot of habits, we lose it. And after that, it's very rare to experience it and becomes impossible because of our layers and layers of bad habits and because of our deep state of hypnosis or ignorance. 
It may be possible in near-death experiences, in very shocking experiences, to have glimpses of being awake, but it's not possible to sustain it unless one's trained, unless we know how to do it and do it by will. Jagrata means awake. And this state of consciousness is characterized not only by the perception of what is outside of us, but by the simultaneous perception of what is inside of us. In other words, our attention is not unidirectional. In the state of Jagrata, one perceives in all directions. It takes energy in the consciousness to do that. And it takes training to know how to do that. Either training or one has eliminated enough ego that that state is already one's natural state. On this planet, such a person is rare. And for them to be at that state, they would have had training in a previous life. To have that ability to be continually conscious depends upon a certain percentage of consciousness being freed of obscuration. In other words, a certain amount of knowledge already had to be acquired. Remember, knowledge is not intellectual knowledge. It is perception of truth. It is perception that is not clouded by ignorance. So this is the third state of consciousness. In all of these lectures that we give, in all of the books that we study, this is the state of consciousness we're attempting to perfect. A state of consciousness being awake. You can sustain an awakened state even if the ego is very strong in you. It can be done. It just takes willpower. Many people say, it's too difficult. I'm just a beginner. I can't do it. These are excuses. These are mechanisms that the ego uses in order to enforce its control. A state of awakened perception can be sustained by anyone. But it isn't easy, especially in the beginning. It takes a lot of willpower, a lot of energy, a lot of effort. The fourth state in Sanskrit is Turiya. That word literally means the fourth. And its equivalent in Greek is nous. There are many people who believe that once they've studied some philosophy and they've learned a few practices, that they can establish the state of Turiya in themselves easily and even adopt that as a name. They are liars to themselves and others. Turiyas, people that establish this level of consciousness, are quite rare on this planet. Turiya is a state of absolutely pure consciousness. That means the ego has been completely removed. No ego. None. Such a being is a perfect being. No lust. No anger. No envy. No fear. Some Turiyas that you can look to for examples... Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Moses. These are Turiyas. That's the level of consciousness of the fourth state. It's very high. A Turiya sees all things without any contradiction in their perception. They see the two truths simultaneously. They perceive conventional reality that we all see, and they see ultimate reality at the same time. No contradiction. No filters. No obscuration. No ignorance. Now, many think when studying these levels of consciousness that to reach the level of Turiya or Nus must be really boring. 
and must be a kind of torture because they study the scriptures that say we have to renounce desire and we have to overcome pleasure and we have to renounce all the enjoyable things in life. And people think, why would I want to be like that? Having nothing, renouncing everything. What we don't grasp is that those levels of consciousness of the third and fourth state are levels of consciousness that are coming closer and closer to the root of being itself, the root of life, the root of existence. They are actually getting farther and farther away from suffering, not deeper into suffering. This idea that to renounce is painful is an idea of the ego who doesn't want to give up attachment. This idea that we should give up the orgasm and give up our wealth and renounce worldly things and materialism, that sounds painful to the ego. And because we don't have perception of the absence of attachment, we assume that it must be horrible because we're attached and we love our attachment and we're ignorant of the suffering that attachment produces. We don't realize that even in the state of Jagrata or Dianoia, when you're awake, you're free relative to your degree of awakening. And the more awake you become, the more free you become. And someone who reaches the level of Turiya or Nus is completely free from all kinds of bondage, suffering. In other words, they're experiencing perfect happiness, contentment, joy, love. You can translate these terms, Turiya and Nus, as ecstasy. In other words, these levels are the state of Eden in Hebrew, which means bliss. This is the bliss of the consciousness. So these levels of consciousness are inside of us. But we don't understand what they mean because we haven't experienced them for what they are. That's why when we begin these types of studies, we emphasize repeatedly, study yourself, watch yourself, look at what you experience, analyze it, try to understand it, try to put it in perspective. We need to see through the illusions that we ourselves sustain. Anyone who studied Hinduism has heard this term Maya. We're not talking about the South American Maya. We're talking about the Sanskrit word Maya. And most people say Maya means illusion and it does. But the meaning of Maya is actually far deeper very compelling and very important. It's one of the most important concepts in Hinduism. Maya comes from the root in Sanskrit, ma. And this root term, ma, means to measure. It also means mother. In most languages in the world, when you say ma or ama, you're saying mother, mom in English, ma, mm. Mom, Amma. But additionally, that uh, root Ma also means not. And so when you look at this word Ma in the context of Maya, literally translated, Maya means not that. So if you study Hindu philosophy or any tradition that's based on Hindu philosophy, like Buddhism, like theosophy, you need to understand that Maya means not that. So throughout the Bhagavad Gita, for example, or the Srimad Bhagavatam, or the Upanishads, or Mahabharata, it's always talked about, do not become a victim of Maya. We have to free ourselves from Maya. 
We have to see through the veil of Maya. Illusion, right? Where does it come from? What is it? What is Maya? Some other meanings of this term. Just as that word ma can mean not, it can mean mother. So if ya is that, it can mean mother that. Maya is the mother, the great mother. And translated directly, Maya can mean enchantment or illusion or appearance. Maya is also the name of the Divine Mother. Lakshmi is called Mahamaya. And that's also the name of the mother of Buddha Shakyamuni. Furthermore, Maya is the name of a demon, a goddess, Maya Sura. So all together, this has become an excuse of some philosophies to reject women, claiming that women are Maya, that women are demon goddesses who weave webs of illusion. This is a misunderstanding of what the teaching is stating. The teachings about Maya are very deep and profound and difficult for the intellect to understand. The mother creates all things. Everything that exists comes from the womb of a mother. Physically, we know this is true with our physical body. It's also true of the universe and all the worlds. Everything that exists comes from the womb of Prakriti, matter or mother. But everything that exists has two aspects, conventional and ultimate. Our physical body has its conventional reality. But because of our lack of knowledge, we ignorantly assume that this body is ourselves. And we ignorantly assume that this body is all we will ever be. And we live in this continual state of maya, illusion. We believe that the appearance of the body is real and important. So we dress the body up. We adorn it with fashion, with makeup, with postures, with language, with hairstyles, all to create an appearance, maya. An appearance to fool ourselves and to fool others. And it is all lies. Our body itself is maya. It is a mother, physically. Our body is a womb. Out of our body will come something, whatever we create in this life. We are the child of our own deeds. Moreover, our body is Maya, not that. Our body is not Atman. Our body is not the Absolute. Our body is not our self. It is not that. So this term Maya is very great significance. We don't perceive the reality. We only perceive illusion. Maya. We need to see through that. See it for what it is. To do that is as we explained, to be here and now. We study these two lines, the line of being and the line of life. Perception of truth cannot happen in the future, and it cannot happen in the past. It happens here and now. Being present, being cognizant of what one sees, not only with the eyes, but with all of our senses, especially the sense of self-observation, the sense of self-awareness. So be here and now. Be here in the body and observe the body. 
and look at it as this, Maya, not that. When you're in your body, remembering yourself, you are not the body. The body is not Atman. The body is not perception. The body is not consciousness. It is just the body. It is a vessel that we utilize. But it is not that. It is Maya. That perception, although it's inside of the body and inside of what we call ourselves, it is still projected outwards from where consciousness emerges. Consciousness or perception emerges out of our pineal gland in relation with the pituitary gland. This is what allows us to perceive, not only through our five physical senses, but through other senses that we're scarcely aware of. Nonetheless, as deep inside of this body as that perception can be felt, it still projects outwards. It's still perceiving outwards. So even if you're in your body, being aware of your body, and you're feeling your heartbeat, and you're feeling your digestion, and you're feeling your breath, the flow of energy of your attention is still moving from the pineal gland out. Right? You can see that for yourself. You can feel that, experience that. Everything that you perceive in that way is maya. Everything. From the pineal gland out. As far across the universe as you can see. That means your pineal gland, your brain, your head, your neck, your chest, your arms, your legs, your body, your neighbors, your house, your room, your bed. Everything that you can perceive is not that. No matter if you look to the past or the future. Everything you can perceive is Maya. And has to be seen as such. Not that. Not Atman. If you want to see God, you have to look the other way. Towards where consciousness is coming from. So feel that. Invert your perception. Not the perception of eyes and ears, tongue, and sensation in the body. Perception itself. Look back into where perception comes from. That is where you can begin to sense Atman. Consciousness comes from Atman. That can only be found at the intersection of these lines. Exactly here and now. In this moment. Looking at all things as Maya. Not that. And looking for that. In all things. So we do this by analyzing and being aware of our three brains. Looking at the body, motor instinctive sexual impulses, and remaining aware of what they are, and seeing them for what they really are. Experiencing them for what they really are. Not being hypnotized by them. Not being attached to sensations or avoiding sensations that are happening, but experiencing them for what they are. Maya, not that. When we have discomfort, when we have hunger, when we have pleasure, these are natural, normal, they happen. Our problem is we believe they're real. We become attached to them or we try to avoid them. Thus, we become hypnotized by them. We forget ourselves. We believe that what we see is the reality and we don't question it. We are asleep. To be in Jagrata, Dianoya, means to analyze what we see and to see it for what it is and to be cognizant of that. 
That means when we experience discomfort or hunger or thirst or pleasure, we just experience it. We deal with it practically, realistically. If the body needs to eat, we feed it. If the body needs water, we give it water. If we experience a pleasant sensation, we experience it. We don't indulge in it or avoid it. If we're in discomfort or pain, we try to care for it and deal with it, but not make a big deal out of it. Not let it take over our life and make us fall asleep. I had a friend recently who told me, just after eating a meal, my stomach's full, but I'm still hungry. Without any awareness of the fundamental importance of that statement. I'm full, but I'm still hungry. The body was already fed. It was the mind that was hungry. It was never that way in all things. Oftentimes, it is not the body that wants sex, it's the mind. And we don't realize it. We say, I need this, I need that. It isn't that. It's an ego that wants, that craves. But we have no cognizant perception of all these impulses that arise in our three brains. They arise and we immediately begin to try to satisfy them. The state of Jagrata, Dayanoya, is a state of revision in which one revises and analyzes everything that emerges in the psyche. Theories, beliefs, impulses, cravings, attachments, urges. Whether those urges are physical or emotional or mental. The state of Jagrata is a state of awakened consciousness that sees ourselves for what we are and it seeks to be responsible, to no longer be a victim of circumstance or driven by impulse that we can't control. Not easy to do, but it can be done. So for this, we study the tree of life in relation with our three brains. Our three brains, intellect, emotion, and body, are perceivable here if we look. We're not going to see a brain in our heart. When we look for that brain of emotion, we look for how emotion processes in us. How do feelings and impulses, emotional impulses, process? That is to observe the emotional brain. And the same with the mental processes and physical processes. And on the tree of life, we map this all out in ever-increasing degrees of subtlety. We begin here in the body, analyzing our body. What is maya? What is real? What is true? We look at our physical presence. We become aware of the sephira malkut, which means kingdom. This is our kingdom. And we seek to be aware of that. And to become aware of the physical body is a good step. And to sustain awareness of the physical body is a good step. We scarcely do that. Furthermore, to go deeper, we have to start becoming aware of our vital energy. This is the energy of the vital body or ethereal body, which corresponds with the sephira. Yes, sod. How do we experience that energy? How do we perceive that energy? By looking. By looking, 
by questioning, by analyzing what we see and experience and understanding what the vital body is. In the previous lecture by the other instructor, we heard about the four ethers of the vital body. We need to know those ethers and be able to examine them and study them because they affect us every moment. Those four ethers are really important. It's not just the theory to post in your notebook. They are something that you can see and experience for yourself. Not with your physical senses, but with your consciousness in observation of yourself. You need to be able to see the four ethers and understand how they function, what they do. In synthesis, they are an intermediary between the physical body and the other bodies. The ethers conduct energy. Not only chemical energy, vital energy, and energy that illuminates and activates the physical body, but energy of consciousness. Everything you perceive through your physical body was reflected through your vital body, through the luminous and reflecting ethers. Everything you perceive while you're in your physical body passed through your vital body. The quality of those perceptions is determined by the quality of energy of your vital body. This is why people who fornicate and who abuse their energy cannot see anything clearly because the ethers of their vital body are depleted, are impure, very dirty. Someone who transmutes their energy begins to cleanse and restore and nourish the ethers of the vital body, which in turn brighten our perception. It's much like polishing a mirror. And when someone has raised the kundalini of the vital body, that cleansing and that transmission of energy is even greater. This is very important. If you want to see the truth, you need your vital body to be very clean and that energy to move easily as it transmits energy from inside to outside and outside to inside. You see how Yasad acts somewhat as a boundary between the physical realm and the internal world. Your memory of dreams depends on your vital body. Your memories from meditation, from astral projection, depend upon your vital body. Going deeper, we analyze from moment to moment the contents of emotional impulses that move us. And these are a reflection of the sephira hod, our emotional energy. And furthermore, our mental energy, thoughts related with netzach. And then further, will or human consciousness related with tiferet. All of these psychic aspects can be seen and experienced while we're in our physical body, can be analyzed, can be measured, can be experienced. We don't have to take as mere belief these studies of Kabbalah. We can experience them. We can see how these all relate when we start to observe ourselves. We start to experience the energy and how they function. All of this becomes easy. Shankaracharya continues and states, Avidya, indescribable and beginningless, is the cause, which is an upadi superimposed on Atman. Know for certain that the Atman is other than these three conditioning bodies. In its identification with the five shes, the immaculate Atman appears to have borrowed their qualities upon itself, as in the case of a crystal, which appears to gather unto itself the colors of its vicinity. Here, Shankaracharya reveals that he knows Kabbalah. Doesn't call it that, but it's the same teaching. This passage starts, Avidya, indescribable and beginningless, is the cause, which is an upadi superimposed on Atman. So let's understand that sentence, because without that, the rest will make no sense. Avidya is the same thing as ignorance. 
vidya. A means without or lacking. Vidya is knowledge. Vidya is a deep term. It has a lot of implications. But avidya essentially is translated as ignorance, a lack of perception, a lack of understanding. Avidya, indescribable and beginningless, is the cause of what? Suffering. Is the cause of us not seeing Atman. And he says, which is an upadi, superimposed on Atman. Upadi means conditioning object. Obstacle. Filter. When you put something in a sack, the sack is upadi. We are in our upadis. The physical body is an upadi. It is a limitation. It is a container. It is a filter. That is neither good or bad. It is what it is. The problem is that we don't see the upadi for what it is. It is superimposed on Atman, like a crystal. When we look at a crystal or a diamond, we see the light. We look at the colors. We don't see the thing itself. We put onto the object the attributes that are superimposed on it. We put upon our perceptions, superimpositions. We see the conventional reality, not the truth. So what he's describing here, know for certain that the Atman is other than these three conditioning bodies, three conditioning upadis. So let's go back and see what he's talking about here. The three conditioning bodies that condition our perception of Atman. As we explained previously, Atman is related to Chesed on the tree of life. Chesed is a light, an intelligence that emerges from the Trinity above. Chesed is our spirit, our innermost, our inner Buddha, our Atman, self. That light descends and fills the vessels, giving life, what we experience as being alive. Those vessels are our bodies, physical body, vital body, astral body, mental body, causal body, even the buddhik. When Shankaracharya says the three conditioning upadis, this is a standard element in Vedantic philosophy. Those three conditioning upadis are first, the physical body. Second, what is called in Sanskrit, the subtle body, which is actually just mental, astral, and vital bodies considered as one. And the third is the causal body, Tifrit. So these three upadis, or conditioning factors, are like a crystal that reflect light. The light is Atman. Unfortunately, ignorant people study the philosophies, study Atman, and think, I'm Atman. My physical body is a reflection of Atman. My vital body, my astral body, my mental body, my causal body are reflections of Atman. So I am that. This is wrong. We are not that. Atman is Atman. The rest is Maya, not that. Whatever experiences you have in your physical body is Maya, because we're asleep. Only when one is awake, Jagrata or Turiya, does one see that Atman. If one is asleep, it is all Maya, not that. Simple. In the next passage, he explains the five sheaths. 
In its identification with the five she's, the Immaculate Atman appears to have borrowed their qualities upon itself. We look inside and we think what we see is a reflection of God. This is especially a danger for people who study spirituality and learn how to meditate and get out of their bodies and experience their astral and mental bodies and travel in their vital body or causal body. And they begin to think in the same way we do in our physical bodies. We think here and now in our physical bodies, I am me. I am what I see. I am that. It's real. And this is wrong. But then we become spiritual. We learn to meditate and go in the astral plane or the mental plane. We have an experience in our astral body and we think, this is me. This is myself. And that's wrong. That's a lie. Same goes all the way until we experience even the causal body in the sixth dimension. Those experiences need to be questioned because they are also Maya. Not that. All these bodies are real in the conventional sense. But in the absolute sense, they are Maya. So we study these five sheaths in detail to understand how to perceive what is fundamentally true. We begin here physically with Anamaya Kosha. Anamaya Kosha is the name of the physical body in Vedantic philosophy. Kosha means body. But literally translated, Kosha means that which is dissolved. Our physical body is not fundamentally real. Conventionally, it exists for a brief period of time, however many years we're able to survive in this body. But ultimately, from the, sen from the perspective of Atman, the physical body is very temporary, very impermanent. And Atman can see through it, but does not abide in it, does not depend on it, and is not it. Our physical body is maya. So you see the name? Anamaya kosha. In Sanskrit, ana means food. So literally translated, anamaya kosha means food, not that, which dissolves. Or food illusion, that which dissolves. Or anama, measured out by food. So anamaya can be that which is measured out by food. The physical body, of course, is sustained only because we eat. What we eat creates the body. If we eat poorly, the body's sick. If we eat well, the body's healthy. Very basic. We don't get it because we like to eat bad things. We like to put in the body things that it shouldn't have. Nonetheless, we can all analyze and observe and experience this anamaya kosha, the sheath, of the physical body, which is maya, not that. It is not atman. It is not self. It is temporary. We can all verify through our experience that we can experience and perceive without this body. If you've had a dream, then you know it. You have experienced that. You have experienced a sense of self outside of the physical body. Thus, you know the physical body is maya, not that. Not the self. The next sheath is pranamaya kosha. Prana means life force, vital energy. But nonetheless, even the vital body is maya. It is kosha, that which is dissolved. 
Kosha can be translated as sheath or body, but really it means something that is not fundamentally real, something that is impermanent. It will exist briefly and die. If we seek immortality, then we must first begin to recognize what is not more immortal and begin to realize what is immortal. If we have attachment and dependency on the physical body, we will suffer when the physical body is taken. And we know this is true when anyone we love dies. We build attachment to the body. And we suffer because that body is taken. And we have the ignorance of thinking and believing that thus that person is taken from us forever. And that's wrong. We don't see reality. We have just too much attachment. The next kosha is manomaya kosha. This kosha means, or this term, uh, means that which discriminates. Mano maya is derivative of the same root of maya, ma. Mano comes from manas, which means mind or discriminative factor, cognitive factor. But really it comes from ma or man to think, to measure from ma. And mano maya kosha, if you read traditional interpretations of scripture, most Hindu philosophers call this the mental body. And they talk about mental traveling and mental projection. And really, it's the same thing that we talk about now when we say astral body or astral projection. It's just a different term, but we're talking about the same thing. Manomaya Kosha refers to the astral body related with hod. It is that part of us that discriminates based on like and dislike. Emotion. Feeling. It is not intellectual. The intellectual body is vijnana maya kosha, which is related with netza on the tree of life. This is what we call the mental body. So don't be confused if you go and study Vedantic philosophy, or if you've already studied it, and you get confused between how they talk about mental body and intellectual body. It's just a different use of terms, but we're really talking about the same thing. Vijnana maya kosha refers to the mental body, or netzach. Vijnana, as I told you before, means small knowledge, little knowledge. You could also translate it as information. The mental body, of course, is the intellectual aspect of our psyche. And then we have the fifth sheath, related with tiferet, which is called ananda maya kosha. Ananda means bliss. So we can translate this directly as the body of bliss. Of course, everybody thinks this is wonderful. And when you analyze this in comparison with Kabbalah and you understand how this works in relation with the human soul and the causal body, then it all makes sense. Ananda Maya Kosha, the causal body, is derived from the sixth dimension. In the sixth dimension, there is no what we call ego. Ego is limited to the fifth dimension and below. That's why this is called the body of bliss or ecstasy. Experiences of the causal body are experiences of samadhi, a state of consciousness in which the ego is no longer clouding perception. It is the bliss of free, clear perception. Not orgasm, not chocolate, not that kind of bliss that people assume is you have a lot of people studying yoga now that think they only want to get to Ananda Maya Kosha so they can have a lot of bliss. And they don't know what that means. Ananda is the bliss of consciousness. What's very interesting to observe here briefly is as I mentioned in the beginning, 
Maya is the name of the mother of the Shakyamuni Buddha. Maya, the divine mother. And the divine mother, Maya Devi, gives birth to the Buddha Shakyamuni, who is Chesed, Atman. And the chief disciple of Atman Chesed, the Buddha, is Ananda. So you see that the story of the Buddha is symbolic and is Kabbalistic. Buddha is Chesed. Tiferet is Ananda, the chief disciple of Chesed. And Tiferet, Ananda, is our human soul. The consciousness that should be the disciple of our inner guru, our inner Buddha. Now what Shankaracharya was pointing out was that these five sheaths reflect the light of Atman, but are not Atman. But we think they are. What do we think? We think the physical body is our self. And everything we do in our physical body, we think is our own self. Because we are hypnotized. We don't question our perceptions or analyze the physical body as being maya, kosha, illusion that will be dissolved. Further, we think that the impulses and energies related with the vital body are our self. Sexual impulses, memories, images that we project in the mind, desires, and other types of phenomena that we perceive whether physically or in our imagination, are all related with prana maya kosha. Illusionary, illusory energies that will be dissolved. Furthermore, with the astral body, mano maya kosha, we think that our feelings, that our discriminatory uh, perceptions between like and dislike, we think that they're real. Moreover, when we're out of the physical body, dreaming, traveling in Manomaya Kosha and Vijnana Maya Kosha, we think what we see is real. That's why when we dream and we're seeing all the images of our dreams, we don't realize we're dreaming. We think it's real. We don't question what we see. We assume what we see is true, but we're wrong. Furthermore, in Ananda Maya Kosha, even someone who's awakening consciousness, eliminating ego, having experiences with the being, with Atman, begins to believe they are that and becomes hypnotized through their perceptions, thinking that what they see and experience is real and is their self, and they are wrong. It is Maya, illusion, not that. And they fall into mythomania, and they fall into pride and attachment. This is why he writes, through discriminative self-analysis and logical thinking, one should separate the pure Atman from within the sheaths as one separates the rice from the husk and bran, etc., that are covering it. The Atman does not shine in everything, although he is all-pervading. He is manifest only in the inner equipment, buddhi, just as the reflection in a clean mirror. Buddhi, directly translated, means intellect. But it doesn't mean our intellect. Buddhi is also a discriminative factor, an ability in the consciousness to perceive and define what is perceived. Buddhi on the tree of life is related with Gebra, which is right next to Chesed and Tiferet. Buddhi is an aspect of spirit, an aspect of Atman. It is like the container that transmits the light. It is like a as Blavatsky said when she was quoting scripture, it is like the lamp that the light comes from. It is the glass or crystal that projects it. 
Buddhi is an aspect of our own consciousness. It is not separate from us. But it's very subtle from our perspective being asleep. It's hard for us to sense it or see it or understand what it means. Buddhi is the ability of the pure light of Atman to be reflected. What this means is that here in our physical body, being confused by everything that we see and taking everything that we see as real, we don't see anything for what it is. We don't look inside to question our perception or to see where our perception is coming from. Thus, everything we see is related with these koshas flowing through our three brains, and we don't question it. We don't realize where it's coming from or what it means. Through meditation, we can learn. Through awakening consciousness, we can learn. And as he explains, by discriminative analysis, we can learn. That discrimination has to begin here and now. Studying ourselves here and now, what we see and how we see. Not just with our eyes, but with our imagination. What are we seeing in our head? What are we seeing in our hearts? And questioning that. Learning to discriminate. That is dianoia or jagrata. It is to be awake and to question what we perceive. This is the basis of the exercise SOL. Whatever we see, subject or object or location, we question it. We step back and look at it as though we've never seen it before. And we continually look at things as though we've never seen them before. And we study them. Not only studying what is outside, but what is inside. And not only seeing what is outside and what is inside, but seeing the relationship between them. And not only seeing that relationship, but how we see it. You can't do that automatically. You can't do that unless you're aware that you're doing it. So we study this tree of life. We're here in the third dimension. Everything we're seeing is third dimensional, but we are seeing the reflections of other dimensions. We can experience the impact of other dimensions here. And you can acquire experience in those dimensions if you awaken. Here in the third dimension, in the physical body, in Anamaya Kosha, we can see our thoughts and feelings. We can see impulses that are emerging in our body. And those don't come from the physical world. Impulses that are in the physical body, the thoughts and feelings in the mind and heart, are reflected into us through the vital body, which is in the fourth dimension. We can't directly perceive that vital body, but we can infer its existence when we analyze our perspective, our perception. Memories, where are they? From your own perspective, actually looking, not theorizing, but watching memories when they come up. Forget what you were taught in school or what your teachers told you. Look at your own experience. Where are memories? Where do they come from? How do they get there? Where are they? They're in the fifth dimension. They're in the mental astral aspect of our psyche. How do we see them? Not with our physical senses. We see them with our vital body, which reflects their contents into the brain. And the brain distributes that information, and our body even reacts. When we have a disturbing memory, our body can react. Some people can remember a trauma and throw up. Some people remember a sexual experience and get aroused. How does that happen? Because we are perceiving things and not questioning them, not analyzing them. We believe they're real. We don't see that they are Maya. And we don't see how they get reflected into us. 
And we think all of this is ourself, and it isn't. It's all an illusion, but we believe it's real. Liberation from suffering begins by seeing the truth, seeing what is real, and abandoning illusion. We don't want to do that. We want to hold on to the illusions. We get confused by all of our memories, desires, wants, longings, cravings, aversions, attachments, our envy, our pride, our lust. All of the images that we project in our mind and try to project outside. It's all lies. It's all maya. It all will be dissolved. Because it is all modifications of koshas, upadis. By analyzing the contents of our psyche from moment to moment, and trying to see the reality in them. We also need to be seeing how we see it. And because we are unaware of how we perceive, we fall asleep. We lose self-awareness, self-cognizance. And as such, we are not capable at this stage of perceiving what buddhi is and what atman is. To see Atman and the light of Atman that reflects through Buddhi, you have to be awake. But that doesn't only happen in the sixth dimension. It can happen physically. Not only in a waking state during your daily activities by being very self-aware and cognizant, but through meditation. In meditation, we seek to shut down the koshas, so that those perceptions of the koshas no longer filter our perception. A proper session of meditation is one in which, firstly, the physical body is put in a complete state of relaxation and no longer interferes. We no longer are concerned with the maya of sensations emerging in the body. Likewise, we relax the vital body. When the physical body relaxes, the vital body also relaxes. We relax our emotions and our mind so that all of this, all of these koshas become very calm, serene, relaxed, and we are no longer identified with those perceptions. In the end, a proper meditation state is one in which we become pure perception. And in that purity of perception, we extract that perception from all of these sheaths until we become tifrit, what is properly called manas in Sanskrit. Ananda maya kosha, the body of bliss. This is a state of samadhi. And even then, in a state of samadhi, without any ego, we have to see that experience is maya, not that. From that perspective, one can then experience what the buddhic body is, buddhi, and the atmic body, atman, the reality of them, the truth. And as I stated, that experience can be had in the physical body while you're active if your consciousness is trained, if you know how to access it. It's what we call a state of samadhi. It is an experience of perception of reality. At the same time, you are perceiving conventional truth. This is how we start to see the truth, what is real. And that's why Shankaracharya wrote, one should always understand, or one should understand that the Atman is always like the king, distinct from the body, senses, mind, and intellect, all of which constitute the matter and is the witness of their functions. This phrase is what has confused people for centuries. Many people who've studied Vedanta have read this and thought, oh, so whatever I see is Atman. 
My perspective of seeing is Atman. I am the witness. I am Atman. And whatever I see is Atman. And they're wrong. That is not what is stated here. What is stated here is that that perception emerges from Atman. And in that state of perception, we can see what Atman is. And we can experience what Atman is. But until we are completely purified of all ignorance, we are not that. We are Maya. There's a great chasm in this philosophy that you have to be cautious with. So he states further, Though Atman is pure consciousness and ever-present everywhere, yet is perceived by the eye of wisdom alone. But one whose vision is obscured by ignorance, he does not see it, as the blind do not see the resplendent sun. The eye of wisdom is awakened consciousness that is not obscured by desire. Any desire but is awake. Atman is pure consciousness and ever present everywhere, yet is, unperceived, yet is perceived by the eye of wisdom alone. But one whose vision is obscured by ignorance, he does not see it, as the blind do not see the resplendent sun. This is our case right now. The light of Atman is shining inside of you but you don't see it because of ignorance, your own ignorance. So when we study this type of scripture, we have to look at it in that way. We are the blind. Our vision is obscured by our own ignorance. It is not anyone else's fault. We don't need to go out on the streets and try to convince everybody about this philosophy and say this philosophy is beautiful and it will help us. No, we need to clean our own ignorance not proselytize, not convert, not debate. We need to clean our perceptions. We need to see the truth inside and outside. Do you have any questions? The perception of Tariyas, or people who see the two truths simultaneously, is very difficult for us to understand. But they see both at the same time, simultaneously, and there's no contradiction. And this is what's written in the Pranaparamita Sutra, that form is emptiness and emptiness is form. It is that. So a way for we, that we can understand that is similar to if you're a person who's had a very difficult and powerful experience. Say, for example, you went to war and you experienced war. You will have a way of looking at things that other people won't share unless they have that same experience. Everything will look different to you. It's the same, but the way you see it is different. The way you understand it is different. So to a much greater degree, Turiyas are like that. They see what we see, but it means something completely different that the rest of us don't get. Now, on that point, let me point out something really critical that I set up in the beginning but um, uh, hadn't brought into this yet. And that is this. There's another misinterpretation that's often made in these types of studies. And generally, it's an interpretation, a misinterpretation made by those who are studying in the Sutrayana types of levels. And that is, they believe that through the application of these types of philosophies, once you've gained the vision or perspective of someone at the level of Turiya, that you then abandon all beings because you see the fundamental unreality of all things. 
And so in their philosophy, they state, at that level, since you see the ultimate truth of all things, you see that suffering is an illusion, and you're awake. And that's it. But they're wrong. That's a misunderstanding of people who've not studied the entire range of teachings. A real Turiya sees the conventional and ultimate reality simultaneously. They see reality the way we do, but they also see the cause of suffering. Not only that, they realize that they need to act in order to help us see that we produce our own suffering. So a real Turiya does not abandon the world, does not just go off and become a god somewhere in some distant place and forget about us. They do not. They become even more concerned about us. Question here? Uh, you, you talked about um, how we can perceive the four ethers of the five bodies. Can you uh, elaborate a bit just to look? Um, you must be able to look at hmm. To experience for yourself the ethers of your vital body, really, you have to get out of your physical body to directly experience them. But in your physical body, you can experience their effects. And so you can infer their existence. And that's firstly by studying what they are intellectually. You study the four ethers, you understand there's the chemical, the ether of chemical nature, there's the ether of life, the reflecting, and the luminous. So you study those four ethers, understand their functions, and as you analyze and observe yourself, you can start to see how they affect you and how they play a role in your ability to live and be and perceive. So that's where you start. But to actually directly experience that vital body, you have to go into consciously the fourth dimension, which is where it abides. Or you have to awaken the ability to see it from here, which is a type of clairvoyance. So either way. Another question in the back? Mm -hmm. That's right. That's one of the mysteries. Buddha is born because of Maya and then has to see Maya for what it is in order to become the Buddha itself. So it's essential in a way. Absolutely. By having, like what you said, when you, so by having nothing, you have everything. That's right. It sounds contradictory, but that's how it works. Yeah, everything has the Buddha nature. Right. It's a cycle. Yeah. Maya and Buddha. Is there a question back here? How can we develop compassion now so that if we should happen to awaken, we will not be seduced into staying in nirvana? How do we develop compassion now so that if we awaken, we won't be seduced into nirvana? Well, the way you do this is by approaching the path the way we do in the Gnostic tradition. And that is, we study all three paths simultaneously. That is, we study Sutrayana and Mahayana and Tantrayana all together. What that means is that in the Sutrayana level, we study impermanence and death, that we will die, that all things are impermanent, and we study karma and cause and effect, and that everything we do has an impact. And then we apply that to the Mahayana level, and we study how everything that we do affects others. So we should be very careful about what we do and how we do it, because it affects other people. And furthermore, we should seek action that harnesses, or seek um, methods that harness the powers of our actions. And that's the Tantrayana level, where we learn to harness energy, all forms of energy, for the benefit of others. So we have to do that in our own way, at our own level, according to our own understanding, and seek to improve upon that. It's a constant revision of our ignorance. In synthesis, what this means is that as you apply the technique of self-observation and self-remembering, and you're constantly working to be cognizant of yourself, you have to always do that, not only remembering God and remembering Atman and Maya, 
but remembering others. And to not let your teaching and your path and your understanding be selfish. Ultimately, the ones who become the selfish gods and are seduced by nirvanis are those who have not eliminated self-obsession, self-esteem, self-love. If you begin by working on having awareness of others and your impact on others, then you can sustain that all the way to the top. Not easy, but it can be done. So that's why we study those paths united. Is there another question back there? No. Okay. Any more here? Yes. Yeah. Where do impure thoughts and feelings come from? Well, let me answer that by looking again at this chart of the tree of life that shows all the dimensions. And let me explain that this chart that we've um, studied, you know, that everyone studies in Kabbalah, and that has everything arranged in a very um, structured and kind of linear way, is not accurate. It's just a map. A map is not accurate of the place itself. And in the same way, this is not accurate of the experience itself. It's just a guide. The reality is, all of these sephira, sephiroth are here and now united. And they have distinct qualities. And that's why we study them mapped out like this. But in our experience here and now, these are all interpenetrating each other all of them. It's a question of what do we have the capacity to see and experience and recognize? So where do impure thoughts come from? They don't come from this map. They come from inside of us, from our mind. But where? We don't know because we don't have the ability to perceive it. But if you search in yourself, analyze yourself, you can answer that question. Where do they come from? How did they get there? I can give you a long explanation, but it'll just get stored in your intellect, right? It's better for you to start to analyze in your own experience how your thoughts and feelings emerge and sensations. What triggers it? Does anything trigger it? Does it happen randomly or are there causes? Are there conditions? And I will tell you all of it is true. All of that happens. Sometimes it's random, sometimes it's triggered. But it's only through analyzing the contents of your psyche that you can start to understand the causes of our suffering and thereby deal with ignorance and ultimately liberation. What's, what's critical and the reason I'm presenting it to you in that way is because unless you see for yourself, you will not be liberated. It's impossible. You can memorize all of these teachings, but unless you experience it and perceive it in yourself, nothing will change. So the doorway to liberation is right here, right now in yourself, to be watching, analyzing, discriminating, starting to try to figure out what do I see? Is it real? Why do I have to listen to these impulses? Where is Atman? You can see Atman and experience Atman anytime. If you look. The problem is we never look. Even Gnostics. Even Vedantic philosophers or practitioners. Don't look. We get caught up in philosophy and beliefs and debates and believing things and telling ourselves things and trying to project images and we don't look at the projector. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems as if the Divine Mother has to help us do this work. How can we call upon her now for her help so that she can show us what needs to be done? 
yes, the Divine Mother does help us in this work. And the simplest way to call your Divine Mother for help is to remember her. To remember her presence. And to speak with your heart. There are a lot of prayers and mantras that you can learn and use, and those are fine, and she likes those. But ultimately, she's like any mother. She just wants our well-being, our happiness. And she sees that we are producing our own suffering. So when we remember her and act in remembrance of her, we connect with her immediately. And the same is true of Atman, as a matter of fact. The remembrance of divinity establishes a connection. Unfortunately, we don't remember, and that's why we're in ignorance. And that's why we suffer. When you're applying your vital body in meditation, should it be empty or radiant? When you're quieting the vital body in meditation, should it be empty or radiant? You should let it be what it is. In the case of any sensation we experience in meditation, we should not be identified. If the physical body is in discomfort, let it be. If your vital body is agitated, if your energy is agitated, if your heart is serene, agitated, or uplifted, your mind is calm, sweet, or angry, whatever it is, we have to learn to let it be what it is. Consciousness is separate from all of these. And we don't realize it, and that's why we can't meditate. When you learn, as it's stated in the scripture here, to separate the consciousness from the husks that surround it. The action, quality, or characteristic of the husk no longer matters. This is really beautifully told in uh, several of the books by Samuel M. Vior, where he talks about the meditation practices of different Chinese masters. And coming in my memory now is the one in which the Chinese master of Chan, Buddhism was working with his Swatu, his mantra, even though he had dysentery. He did not get up. I don't know if you know what dysentery is, but it's a very afflictive illness. Very powerful diarrhea and discomfort in the body. And it can kill you. He did not get up for meditation in spite of that. He sat with serenity and continued to meditate undisturbed. This shows how weak we are. We get a little pinprick of pain in the knee or we feel a little bit anxious in our heart and we just can't meditate and that's our excuse. And it's because we do not want to meditate and we use those excuses. And this is understandable because we've yet to acquire genuine experience in meditation genuine knowledge. When you actually have true experience in meditation, an experience of Atman, an experience of Samadhi or reality, it gives you great energy to meditate and enthusiasm. And until you have that experience, it's hard to be consistent and have enthusiasm. But it's necessary. We need willpower. We need consistency. We need seriousness. But most of all, we need to learn to not be identified. So if that uh, experience comes, the difficult experiences in any of the sheaths, we have to learn to not be identified with them. Okay, thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. 
Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.